Hi everyone and welcome to again chapter 14 which is environmental health and toxicology. This is sections 2 and 3 so this is going to be a slightly longer video. I'm going to go over everything because you can expect it to show up on the test. However, uh, if you have your question list I'm going to remind you as to one the which ones I am going to be focusing on on your quiz. So if you've got your question list out here are the questions that you need to concentrate on for the quiz. However, again, all of them you can expect to know for the test. All right, for the quiz in section two, numbers two, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, and thirteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, and twenty five. And then in section three, that would be numbers three, five, seven, eleven, twelve, and thirteen. Absolutely no toxicants. And then understand what an LD50 graph is, what it looks like, what it tells you, how to read one, and then all of the other stuff that's in here too. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. All right. So your first question is be able to list specific categories of synthetic chemicals humans are exposed to every day. You've got everything from antibiotics to detergents to drugs to steroids to plasticizers to disinfectants, solvents, perfumes, pesticides. Most of the exposure is at low level in groundwater or in surface water. One of the things that we don't know is how much does it take to have an impact on human health and then is the impact that these things have um, does it matter? Does one enhance the other? Is it multiplicative? Is it additive? Do they cancel each other out? We really don't know. Please remember this always. Infants and children are more susceptible to the toxic effect of chemicals than adults. Um, they eat, drink water, and breathe more per unit body weight than adults, and then all of this other uh, good stuff. Also remember that the elderly and those with already comprised um, uh, purifying system, let's say somebody who's on dialysis because their kidney is shutting down, they're obviously going to be affected by toxic chemicals more as well. All right, one of the first people who brought toxicants into sharp relief was a woman whose name was Rachel Carson. She wrote a book called Silent Spring, and this book talked about what spring would be like if DDT use was uh, continued in the United States. Um, DDT was sprayed everywhere. It was sprayed actually on people at the beaches to keep the bugs and mosquitoes away. Um, and what she noticed is that this particular molecule, which you can see there on the right hand side, is persistent. That means that it doesn't break down. And then also it's fat soluble, so it biomagnifies as it moves up the food chain. Um, so she, the focus of her book is that artificial pesticides in general are hazardous to people's health, the health of wildlife, and the well-being of ecosystems. So what she was basically saying is that this is going to kill everything. And uh, she focused on DDT in particular. Does the U.S. still use DDT? Not since 1973. Do we still make it? Yep. Shipped to other countries largely as a disease vector control. Spraying is largely limited to indoor wall spray which both protects the environment and reduces development of pesticide resistant insects. However, in places where it is sprayed on crops, we then get these crops back to us um, coated with the very DDT we won't use here. Um, I am going to address in question 24 what that picture is there in the lower right hand corner, but uh, in short, DDT, uh, when it magnifies to a certain level uh, up the food chain, it inhibits calcium intake by birds, and when they lay their eggs, they break open. So it was a huge problem for what are called raptors, which are apex predators um, that hunt for their food. All right, this to me is hilarious. Back in the day, DDT was marketed as every housewife's uh, dream because it killed bugs. Um, uh, I don't know that it's on here, but nursery, nursery um, uh, wallpaper. Wallpaper you hung in a baby's room used to be embedded with DDT. Lots of DDT. Um, so it could keep the bugs off. Um, right. 
So if you find this kind of stuff fascinating, I highly recommend you take a look at it. Um, there is a project on Rachel Carson that I'll set up in the room, and if you're interested in looking at this a little bit more, it's really quite amazing how our attitude towards these things has shifted in the past 50 years. Um, let's see what's next. All right, types of toxic chemicals. There's carcinogens, there's mutag mutagens, there's teratogens, there's allergens, and there's neurotoxins. These things can overlap. Carcinogens are chemicals or types of radiation that cause cancer. What are the health effects of carcinogens? Damage body function and or death. How does cancer sometimes lead to death? Malignant cells grow uncontrollably, creating tumors da damaging the body's functioning and often leading to death. And here are two great examples, uh, cigarette smoke and sunlight. All right, mutagens. They are chemicals that cause mutations in the DNA of organisms. Uh, so all carcinogens are mutagens, but not all mutagens are carcinogens. And then what are the health effects of mutagens? Most have little to no effect because those parts of the, your DNA you don't use, um, but some can lead to severe problems, including cancer and other disorders. If mutations take place in sperm and egg cells, the individual's offspring can suffer. Um, and do also realize not all DNA mutations are caused by um, mutagenic substances. Some can be spontaneous. All right, what are teratogens? They are chemicals that cause harm to an unborn child. What are the health effects of teratogens? Uh, they affect the development of human embryos in the womb. They cause birth defects, and sometimes they cause death. What is the teratogen cited by your book? Its name, how it was ingested by humans, its health effects. It was called thalidomide. It was a nausea prevention pill for pregnant women. It was originally uh, tested in Germany, and it was tested on... Uh, it's a sleep, sleeping and nausea prevention pill. The tests um, uh, that they did were not on animals that were pregnant. So it was given to pregnant women because uh, talk about needing help sleeping and overcoming nausea. Uh, so it took until about the 1960s for them to realize that these profound birth defects, um, e even one dose would cause deformities uh, it came from thalidomide. Uh, it often led to the death of the infant. They're born without arms and legs. Hands and feet are attached to the body, and internal organs are misshapen. This whole disaster strengthened the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's power in regulating medicine. Um, and this is an example of a thalidomide baby. I believe your book has a tennis pro who is playing uh, tennis, uh, and their hand sprouts directly out of their shoulder area. All right, allergens. How do allergens interact with the immune system? They overactivate the immune system, causing an immune response when one is not necessary. And that's everything from cat dander to pollen to uh, peanut allergies. And these things can be just annoying or they can kill you because if you end up swelling up a lot, that means your throat will swell shut and you will lose the ability to breathe. Um, name three heavy metal neurotoxins. You have lead, metal, and cadmium. Um, uh, these are some other ones, arsenic and copper. Uh, and uh, let's see, we've got cadmium in here. So, all right, so we've got them all. I'm going to talk about this during in the supplemental lecture. It has to be in a form that causes negative effects on the nervous system. Exposing yourself to straight up copper is not going to give you problems. It has to be in the appropriate form in order to harm you. All right, so um, also to talk about these things in general. When they are in the correct form and they, they build up in your fatty tissues, they cause permanent damage. This is where Mad Hatter's disease came from, uh, the, the uh, buildup of mercury in the system. It can cause uh, schizophrenia. All right, what happened in Minamata Bay, Japan? A chemical factory um, dumped, uh, where is it? Dumped mercury waste in the bay. It bioaccumulated and biomagnified into the fish, which animals and humans ate. First cats, and this I think is in the 50s, first cats began convulsing and dying. What happened to humans? In adults, it was slurred speech, loss of muscle control, and sudden fits of laughter, and then eventually death. Um, fetuses that were exposed to mercury had permanent disabilities, as you can see the, um, the child there in the red coat. Um, the company only paid out $5,000 per affected individual. Do you also realize, um, and this is something that pops up on the national exam, 
coal contains mercury. And so if that is not dealt with when you're burning it to create electricity, um, you're going to have problems. All right. Um, at what concentration do hormones generally exist in the bloodstream? Ex extremely low concentrations. What are the implications of this? It doesn't take a high concentration of an endocrine disruptor to cause negative effects in an organism's physiology. Ooh, sorry, I forgot about this part. This is something we will return to when we start talking about coal burning power plants. This just gives you an idea of how uh, mercury finds its way into the food chain. And you can see it has to be Hg2 plus uh, in order for this to be a problem. And uh, especially uh, not only Hg2 plus, plus, but attached to this, this is called methylmercury. That is the form that gets absorbed uh, up the food chain. All right, and that I won't necessarily test you on uh, this particular unit. Uh, well, maybe I will, I don't know. Uh, if, it, if I put it in the supplemental lecture, definitely know that it is this form of mercury that is an issue. All right, uh, differentiate between hormone disruptors and hormone mimics. Hormone disruptors block the action of hormones or accelerate their breakdown, and then hormone mimics interact with receptor molecules just as an actual hormone would. Get your book out. Look at figure 14.8 on page 391 for a pick of a hormone mimic. So in other words, a hormone disruptor is going to keep you from getting the amount of hormones that you need, and a hormone mimic is actually going to uh, increase the amount of hormone you already have, or perhaps introduce a new one into your system that then interacts with your receptor cells. All right, gender benders, which are called, which are estrogen mimics, if males, especially human males, ingest the low levels of estrogen. They do not grow secondary female sexual characteristics. It's usually something that prevents them from losing weight and then um, lowers the effect of testosterone on them. All right, so, uh, and then things that disrupt your thyroid can have all kinds of icky problems. All right, here are the normal hormone process. Here's a hormone mimic and then a hormone blocker. All right, so where am I? Okay. Um, based on the opening case study and the research presented on endocrine disruption, what categories of organisms are impacted by estrogen mimics? Um, they uh, become either female or hermaphrodites when exposed to low estrogen, uh, low levels of estrogen mimics. Uh, fish, frogs, reptiles like alligators, and invertebrates. Uh, in humans, we are beginning to find that not only does it lead to um, uh, weight retention, it can also lead to lowered sperm counts and testicular cancer um, in men, and breast cancer is also a pos possible impact in both men and women. Uh, that's specifically for the estrogen one. Uh, but all of them, I think, uh, cancers are, well, not I think, I know cancers are an issue. All right. Um, how do endocrine disruptors possibly impact human fertility? I already talked about that. What type of cancer appears to be influenced by exposure to endocrine disruptors, testicular and breast cancer? What human systems, other than the reproductive system, do endocrine disruptors appear to affect? What are some of these effects? That would be the brain and the nervous system. The biggest impact is on the fetus of women who ingest food contaminated with the endocrine disruptor. Your book, your book cites PCBs and Great Lake fish. Impacts include babies with lower birth weight and smaller heads who then grow up to have weak and jerky reflexes and lower scores on intelligence tests. Okay, why is it important when you're, by the way, when you're reading all of these studies about this stuff, please be skeptical. This is the issue that we had back in the day when the, um, uh, the man who helped to single-handedly lower the number of uh, vaccines that were offered uh, caused problems because his uh, research was not viewed in a skeptical fashion. Um, you need to figure out the validity of the study. So what are some things you should consider? The funding source may skew conclusions drawn from data. An example um, in the book cites the effect of BPA on lab animals. Um, studies done by industry show no ill effects. Government funded studies showed ill effects. In other words, it's like the studies that the um, cigarette companies used to put out saying that not only were cigarettes not harmful, they are beneficial to you. Uh, obviously they're going to get those results. So make sure you read the fine print um, before you take anything to part. All right, excuse me for one second. 
All right, let's see what the next question is. How can toxicants end up in ro water runoff, just like everything else? Um, this isn't in your book. It's also excretion by humans, especially in the case of pharmaceuticals, medicines. Uh, what type of aquatic organism can be used as an indicator species? Fish, frogs, and stream invertebrates. Honestly, when in doubt, when it comes to uh, an indicator species for endocrine disruptors, go with frogs. Um, any toxicants, really, um, because they uh, absorb stuff through their skin. Um, all right, figure 14.11, uh, name three ways that toxicants can enter the human system. Hunting and harvesting, food, medicines and materials, uh, workplace exposure, consumer products, drinking water, air, uh, it's something called pesticide drift. Uh, your genetics, you can get them through the womb. Not everything is blocked by the placenta. And then also breast milk, and that's for fetuses and babies. So um, here are ways that toxicants, uh, drinking water um, through the air, food that you harvest. Again, here are sources of toxicants. All right, um, where do global wind patterns sy uh, system, uh, excuse me, systemically push airborne toxicants? That would be the polar regions. All right, um, let's see. All right, so let's talk about bisphenol A, which is BPA. Um, I am going to be giving you a grid moving forward that you're gonna be able to write diseases, or excuse me, uh, uh, toxins on. And so I would start keeping track of names, uh, how uh, people are exposed to them, and then what their effects are. Okay, bisphenol A is found in a lot of stuff. You may notice that a lot of plastic bottles are popping up BPA free. Well. Um, uh, it is uh, been shown to have uh, when uh, eggs are exposed to it, they have genetic anomalies. Um, further studies linked ob obesity to ingestion of BPA. And uh, given that the additive was present in baby bottles, what might the impact in the infants be? Genetic anomalies in female eggs, ob obesity in both genders. How would this compare to the additive's impact on adult humans? It wouldn't be as uh, immediately severe, but chronic exposure could lead to the same problems. In other words, over time. This is why I'm telling you guys, do not heat food up in plastic containers, especially food that contains um, acidic stuff like tomato sauce. Uh, because anything that is in the plastic, even if it says BPA-free, there's a lot of other stuff that's in there and can end up in your food and over time uh, accumulate in your system and cause issues. All right, and here are the laboratory findings. Um, this is also why you shouldn't be heating up baby bottles in the microwave. All right, and uh, remember again the idea of uh, biomagnification. We may have to do this uh, demonstration in the, uh, the class again. Um, what quality in a toxicant gives uh, the greatest uh, potential to harm many organisms over long periods of time? Again, persistence. It doesn't break down into simpler, less harmful chemicals. And then again, this. Uh, this isn't in your book, but we've talked about it before. Uh, Fat-soluble compounds are also more of a problem than water-soluble compounds because this leads to biomagnification. If it's water-soluble, you pee it out at some point. If it's fat-soluble, you store it in your fat stores. And even a very, very mild, uh, low level of a toxicant, as you can see here, by the time it gets to the top of the food chain, and we are at the top of the food chain, it can be uh, at high enough levels to be a problem. All right. Um, and again, how do we get the stuff into our body? Uh, all of these uh, different ways. And I feel like I've skipped something. Sorry, guys, I'm just reading my notes. All right, oh, it is in your notes. What is the classic mechanism that can, even, uh, that can make even minute quantities of waterborne toxicants lethal? Biomagnification, built up in fatty tissues, sometimes muscle, muscle tissues like methylmercury. All right, um, I think we already talked about this, but just uh, remember that toxicants can enter the human body basically anywhere. You can inhale it, you can absorb it just by touching it from your skin, eating it, so it goes through your, um, uh, your digestive system, through mu mucous membranes and talking like your eyes, <coughs> and then sometimes they can go through the placental barrier. It doesn't necessarily catch everything. All right, we talked about this before. How did DDT cause drastic decline in raptors and other apex predator birds from the 50s to the 70s? Thinning of bird eggshells so that they broke in the nest before chick development was complete. 
and what it did was inhibited um, calcium metabolism. All right, how does PCB end up concentrated in polar bears? Fish to seals to polar bears, it's biomagnification. What are some of the effect of PCBs on polar bears? Um, immune suppression, hormone disruption, high cub mortality. PCBs is just another one of those, um, uh, those toxicants that you need to know about. Um, I can't remember if I've addressed it or not before, so I'll go ahead and do that right now. One second. It's polychlorinated by uh, phenyl, and um, it is, you know, even the EPA is saying that it is, is adverse to human health. I'll go ahead and look this up and make sure we know where it is that you can find this stuff. All right. So just know it's just one of those toxins that you need to know about that can concentrate up the food chain. All right, are all toxicants synthetic? Uh, the answer is no. Toxicants can include snake venom, which is right here. This is a spitting cobra, um, poison ivy secretions, pollen for some, and then the botulin toxin from bacteria, which is actually what we use in Botox to make ladies' faces freeze in place. All right, section three. I'm gonna go ahead and speed this up a little bit. Sorry for my delays in the previous section. How can scientists make correlation between toxicants and their effect on living organisms? It's called a correlative study and manipulative experiments. Uh, not super important. I just want for you to know how this uh, goes together. All right, what is main, one major drawback to an epi uh, epidemiological study? Okay, this is where you test a bunch of people over a long period of time to make absolutely certain that what you think is causing the problem is actually causing the problem. The huge problem, again, is time. You, you can't, sometimes you can't wait um, while, you know, people are having problems with something, uh, and then you can't predict, uh, predict the effects of uh, new products. You've got to let stuff happen. Um, this is where our innocent until proven guilty um, policy here in the United States can be an issue, like it was with, for example, thalidomide. All right, can they definitively prove that a hazard caused a particular effect? No, they only show a statistical association. Uh, you need manipulative experiments to establish causation. That would be where you'd have to do animal testing. All right, this is a very important part of this particular unit. It is something called a linear dose response curve, um, either with or without a threshold. LD50 is the median lethal dose. That is the dose that can kill 50% of the animals in a test population. Within an 18-day period, not as important. Different types. You have an S-curve, you have one that's linear, and then you have one that has a threshold dose, dose response. Here are the differences. This one is an S-curve. If I gave you this graph and I said, tell me what the LD50 is, you would simply go to the right-hand side of the graph, which has percentage of population killed by a given dose. Go to 50, go across until you touch the line, and then come down and that is the dose at which you kill 50% of your stuff. Why is this important? This is how we measure the toxicity of substances. If the LD50 is like one microgram, you probably don't wanna to be touching it. If the LD50 is 1,000 pounds, it's probably not toxic to you. So this really allows us to compare and contrast um, different toxins. All right, here's a linear dose response. That means the more you take, the worse it gets. Um, here you can see it's nonlinear. Uh, you have this sudden uptick. And then a threshold dose response means that you see no ill effects until you reach a certain amount, and then you start seeing effects. All right. Um, all right, so going over this again, a linear uh, dose response curve tells us a toxicant has even effects. Uh, uh, you know, every dose is more, and then it has an effect even when you take it right away. One with a threshold means that you have to hit this magic number and then you start seeing effects. Uh, we already talked about the LD50 is and how it allows you to compare and contrast. What variables can affect an individual's response to exposure to a hazard? Uh, your gender, your age, your weight, your current health, genetics, other hazards the person has been exposed to or was exposed to in the past. All right, contrast uh, acute exposure and chronic exposure. An acute exposure is high exposure in a short amount of time, like an accidental exposure or an oil spill, chemical spill, nuclear accident, or let's say you just have an inborn allergy that kills you on the spot. So that's where you like fall down on the ground shaking immediately. Okay, chronic is you have uh, characteristically a lower exposure of a long period of time, 
like the after effects of smoking or even secondhand smoke or alcohol abuse, the effect of residues in drinking water. And the effects can either be acute or chronic, like it can build up and then all of a sudden, you know, you get cancer or, or you, you know, you, you die, or it can be a lingering problems. All right. Uh, what are different ways that synergistic effects work? All right. Synergistic means uh, happening at the same time when you are exposed to two different toxins. They can be summative, like this one does this damage, this one does this, this damage, you get both. Um, they could cancel each other out. Um, they could be, uh, they can multiply. Like uh, you have this effect with this one, you have this effect with that one, but you take the two together and it's terrible. Um, a lot of this stuff can't be predicted because of all the things that we are exposed to. All right, how can toxicant exposure lead to negative non-toxicant effects? Um, as an example, uh, this is in your book, frogs with suppressed immune system from pesticide are more uh, vulnerable to parasites that normally don't bother them. It's, that, it's like that idea of when you have HIV AIDS, it's not the HIV AIDS that kills you, it's the dis other disease that you catch while you have HIV AIDS, um, which I have said right there. All right, please do realize that HIV AIDS is not a, uh, a chemical toxicant. Uh, be able to tell the difference between all of those different types of toxicants. All right, how does pesticide exposure impact child development? You have delayed coordination, poor physical endurance, poor long-term memory, and you can see from these pictures, poor uh, fine motor skills. All right, this one's also really interesting to me. Uh, how does actual risk and perception of risk differ? People often worry unduly about negligibly small risks, but happily engage in other activities that pose high risk. For example, there's the perception of flying as being riskier than driving in a car, when statistically you are a lot safer in a plane than you are in a car. Uh, please make note of these things that are here on the bottom. I don't have a question necessarily going with them, but greatest health risks are if you are poor, if you are female, and if you make poor lifestyle choices. We're going to talk about this a little bit later, but in general when you're poor, you are more likely to have things like landfills set up next to your house. All right. Uh, and here's another thing. People don't understand risk assessment. They're often uh, will protect themselves from sensational threats like the avian flu, which is currently not an issue, rather than real ones like the common flu, uh, which kills 36,000 people a year in the United States. So if you're really interested in what is risky and what is not, I encourage you to take a look at these articles. And again, what plays into this, all of these things, uh, degree of control especially. Okay, why do we care? Because when we're trying to stop people from using certain things, if they don't feel like it's actually a risk, they're not going to bother. All right, and here you can see um, risks. And here's another one. Right here, poverty is the number one killer. Uh, here again. All right, back to your questions. Uh, con oh, let's see. Name three U.S. organizations responsible for risk management. That would be the EPA, which is the Environmental Protection Agency. It would be the CDC, which is the Center for D Disease Control, and the FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration. Um, laws and who oversees them, I'm going to go over the, well, you know what, I'll go to this now. And when it says add to your acronym to list, I'll remind you to do that a little bit later. All right. The One more question before I get to those laws. Contrast innocent until proven guilty approach to the precautionary principle approach when assessing consumer risk. When you do innocent until proven guilty, you don't assume something is a problem until a problem arises. This is basically uh, how capitalism occurs. You don't want to block somebody's ability to make a profit unless and until it is an issue. Um, uh, the precautionary principle says that you prevent deployment of new products until they are deemed to be harmless. Uh, take a look at figure 14.17 on page 404 of your textbook for a little bit more on that. Okay, here are some laws that you need to know and who oversees them. There is the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which is overseen by the Food and Drug Administration. They do spot checks on this stuff to make sure that you're getting what you're supposed to be getting and there's nothing in there that harms you. Again, realize um, they don't have quite the stringent measures in place that the EPA does, so uh, you know, some things you should be taking at your own risk, like again, health supplements as an example. All right, FIFRA, we talked about in the previous uh, chapter that are the previous unit, that's a regulation of pesticides, all of them, uh, fungicides, insecticides, rodenticides, um, and that is overseen by the EPA. 
The Toxic Substance Control Act regulates synthetic chemicals not covered by other laws. That is also regulated by the EPA. And then OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Act. It regulates workplace hazards. One of the reasons why you have an eye wash and a shower and a hood in our classroom is not it protects both you and myself from possible harm in case of an accident. Those are specifically in there because of OSHA. OSHA, the law, is overseen by OSHA, the organization. It is the Occupational Safety and, and, and Health Association. All right. Um, okay, we already talked about this. Please realize in the national exam you could be presented with a problem and ask which U.S. law organization would deal with it. All right. And we already talked about that stuff. Um, there's the precautionary principle. All right. Um, all right. Before we talk about this, what are the dirty dozen? Uh, memorize DDT, dioxins, and PCBs. Aha, uh -huh. here's where we're going to talk about PCBs. I'm sorry that I stopped before. All right, Pers POPs are persistent organic pollutants that are targeted by the Stockholm Convention, which I'm going to talk about here in a second. They are toxic chemicals that persist in the environment, bioaccumulate in the food chain, and often can travel long distances. The dirty dozen are the worst of the worst. I would suggest memorizing three. That would be DDT, which is a pesticide that controls termites, textile pests, insect vectors, a means of disease, and insects in agricultural soil. Uh, there's dioxins, which is an unintentional byproduct of incomplete combustion in chemical manufacturing. And then PCBs, um, which is an industrial chemical used as a heat exchange fluid in uh, electrical transformers and capacitors, and it's also an additive in paint, sealant, and plastics. I would just know that one is something that's used in manufacturing, and then also you can find it in paint, sealant, and plastics. All right, um, the Stockholm Convention is a global treaty that would that bans or phases out those dirty dozen. U.S. we signed the treaty, but we did not ratify it, which means we're like this is a good idea, but we're not actually going to do anything about it. So, this is often brought up in the national exam as which international treaty did the United States not 100% sign off on, and this is one of them. All right, you need to also be able to differentiate between U.S. laws and international laws. And that brings us, finally, to the end.